Coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition, a new report on just how much San Diego could save with pension reform. And California gets a report card on corruption in government. We'll also take you aboard a rare tall ship in San Diego Bay. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. Joanne Farian has the night off. A new report says San Diego's pension reform initiative will save the city money, but not through reforming the pension system. The city's independent budget analyst says Proposition B savings will come from salary freezes. The IBA says those freezes will lead to $963 million in savings over 30 years, but it says moving employees from guaranteed pensions to a 401k style plan could cost the city $13 million over the same period because of the employer match of 9.2 percent and a new death and disability program for future employees to replace one in the current plan. The IBA also says the council could someday vote to give employees a raise instead of sticking to the salary freeze. It's official. Five candidates will run for mayor of San Diego in June. Among the familiar faces are Councilman Carl DeMaio, District Attorney Bonnie Dumanis, Congressman Bob Filner, and Assemblyman Nathan Fletcher. The fifth candidate is less well-known. Tobia Pettis is a web-based business owner. Eight other would-be mayors fell short of the 200 signatures needed to qualify for the ballot. Three other candidates in San Diego have no challengers for their seats. Todd Gloria and City Attorney Jan Goldsmith and candidate Mark Kersey faces no opposition in his bid for Carl DeMaio's council seat. Stories of political corruption have made headlines across the country over the past few years, but are efforts to clean up government corruption working? Amitha Sharma is talking about that with her guest at the Evening Edition Roundtable. Democracy is at its best when people know how their taxpayer dollars are spent, when special interest influence over government is scrutinized, and when lawmakers' actions are transparent. But a new investigation of all 50 states shows that state governments get poor marks for being open and accountable. Carol Goodhue Schull with Investigative News Source joins me to talk about the results. Carol, the investigation ranked all 50 states for corruptibility. How does California score? Not that badly. It ranked as fourth among the states. So it ranked as fourth. Now, is that ranking connected to the strength of the accountability slash transparency laws on the books or the actual application of those laws? I think in some cases the application is good, but where it seems to be strongest is having good laws on the books and some differences about how effective they are. Now, let's break some of these categories down. California has some of the most transparent or strong campaign finance disclosure laws on the books, yet big money is still running state politics. How is that? Well, though the disclosure laws are awesome and they're very well enforced, the limits, in fact, are pretty meaningless. They are higher for a, a governor if you want to contribute money to a governor than for a federal campaign. So they're very generous limits to begin with and then the loopholes around them are many and uh, they're well used. Now California voters have made it clear that they want term limits for state legislators. How long do these legislators have to wait before they can become consultants and strategists and start influencing their former colleagues once they leave office? Well actually they can walk right out the door and become a consultant. To be a lobbyist where they're directly influencing their former colleagues they're supposed to wait a year. Uh, but that uh, strategy of becoming a consultant allows them to continue to have some effect. Is that long enough? Maybe not, um, but it's, it seems like they're not paying attention to the one-year limit, so you wonder if a two-year limit would make a difference. Okay, now California has an ongoing budget crisis, which everyone knows about. Last year, they spent $4 billion to plug a pension budget hole. Yet, you found that decisions, pension decisions for state workers are not being made in taxpayers' interests. Why? Uh, one of our sources, or several of our sources, explained that the system is set up by constitution 
that the pension board has to put the interests of the pensioners first. And that came about because of an attempted raid by uh, former Governor Pete Wilson when times were very good and the pension funds were fat. Now, there appears to be some contradictions also. California gets high marks for gathering public input in the process before a budget is passed, yet the actual decision-making for budgets doesn't really take in the public's input. Explain that. Our source has explained that we're quite good at inviting people to come in and speak to the legislators, but then when it's time to make a decision, they go behind closed doors. And there are four members of the legislature who meet with the governor, and they make the decisions. And that is not an open process, and that's pretty common. What, what did you find in this investigation that surprised you? Well, one nice surprise, actually, was that redistricting was pulled off as well as it was. Its first time out, the Public Redistricting Commission managed to score very highly with our sources in terms of openness. They had uh, 34 hearings. They received uh, many, many, 20,000 written communications, lots of suggested maps. They set up places where people could get help in drawing their own maps to suggest to the commission. And it was quite an open process. It was not geared to preserve safe seats for those already in office. That was not their mission. And uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, hubbub as a result of that. Very quickly now, um, so the investigation was done, this information was gathered, but how is it going to be used? Well, I think what uh, our sponsoring organizations hoped is that the good government groups that are active in lobbying for change will take the, these results and use them to try to plug the holes and fill the gaps. Carol goodhue thank you for speaking to us. Thank you so much. A San Diego-based activist group says despite an apparent breakdown of one of its co-founders, its mission will continue. Filmmaker Jason Russell was detained by police in Pacific Beach late last week. Witnesses say they saw him in various states of undress, walking into traffic and pounding on cars. The CEO of Invisible Children says Russell is now being cared for by his family. He says the group remains committed to stopping warlord Joseph Coney. The Stop Coney video has received more than 83 million views on YouTube since the campaign began earlier this month. San Diego State and Cal State San Marcos will not accept new students next spring. The California State University system says only eight campuses will admit students for spring 2013, and those admissions will be limited to community college transfers. CSU says there could be deeper cuts if the governor's tax measure doesn't pass. SDSU says the school usually doesn't admit students in the spring anyway. It usually meets its enrollment target by fall. The U.S. Supreme Court has denied an appeal from two Christian groups at San Diego State. They had sued over a policy that said officially recognized campus groups cannot discriminate based on religion or sexual orientation. The suit claimed the policy violated relig religious freedom an argument rejected by a federal appeals court. Today's decision leaves the appeals court ruling and policy in place. An attorney for the group says the decision means San Diego State will remain a stronghold of censorship. A 60-year-old tall ship owned by the Indonesian Navy made a brief stop in San Diego. Its crew of more than 70 had to brave San Diego's wettest weekend so far this year. But that didn't stop their mission to extend a hand of friendship to those who came aboard. The storm clouds finally broke and a crewman is scaling the 191 foot mast of this colorful ship from Indonesia. Elizabeth Houston and her children just arrived in time to see it from the Phoenix area. I was very impressed with the riggings because you can't really appreciate it, the, the delicacy, until you're right upon it and it's just amazing. I think it's really like beautiful because in Arizona you don't really see ships a lot, <laughs> so I think it's really cool. This Navy ship with its traditional carvings in wood was first launched in 1953. Today it's more like a floating ad campaign, encouraging tourists to buy, drink and visit Indonesia. One of the missions of any Navy ship is to show the flag, and there are plenty to see on this one. Raymond Ashley is with the San Diego Maritime Museum. There's nothing threatening or intimidating about a tall ship. It really is the highest expression of national sentiment, 
And so when a tall ship shows up in any country, it's an ambassadorial vessel from that country, but it's one that's devoid of any, any sort of overtures of, of threats or military or anything else. It's a pure expression of friendship. We were actually invited into the guest quarters of the ship. The K. Eri Dewaruchi is on a 10-month voyage around the world to extend the Indonesian culture. It's already made stops in Honolulu and San Diego. Now it's on to Mexico and through the Panama Canal and up and down the East Coast. The ship's commander hoped the weather here would be more like back home in the 70s and 80s. I hear in San Diego is the good weather, but if I come to there, uh, it's the bad weather. This is no problem. The ship's voyage around the world will end sometime in October. In a moment, we'll talk with two men honored for letting the sunshine in in local government. And we'll meet a Marine whose survival training led to a new business venture and some really hot stuff. This is KPBS Evening Edition. friends Harry Connick Jr. and Brantford Marsalis embark on a search for their ancestors. This is your family. These are your people. Wow. Wow. I never saw that before. They explore the history of their beloved city. New Orleans. This is one of those places where if that's what you wanted to do, that's what you could do. Finding your roots. Sunday at 8 on KPBS. Doc Martin is back. My goodness. It's a new season, and he's a new dad. Look at that. Brand new little family. It's disgusting. But he's leaving Port Wynn, and they've already replaced him. I'm Dr. Dibbs. The new doctor said I could have some for my ankles. Well, she's wrong. Put it back. Can Martin and Louisa make it work now that there's a baby? Bit of a puzzle there, then, eh, Doc? The season premiere of Doc Martin. Watch new episodes. Part of a season premiere event. March 29th at 8 on KPBS. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by A San Diego lawmaker says state workers shouldn't make more money than the governor. Senator Joel Anderson is sponsoring a bill to limit state workers' salaries to less than what the governor makes. Currently, Governor Jerry Brown earns nearly $174,000 a year. Anderson says about 8,000 other state employees make more than that. A few minutes ago, we took a look at a report on corruption in government. Now, Amitha introduces us to two men dedicated to keeping government honest. She's at the Evening Edition Roundtable. One is a retired accountant in his 80s who chooses to spend his days not on the golf course, but keeping San Diego's elected officials in check. The other ran a research lab at the Salk Institute, but now runs a nonprofit that advocates for open government. They may be a pain in the neck to politicians, but they are civic heroes to many citizens. They are longtime civic activists Mel Shapiro and Ian Trowbridge. Mel, you have monitored San Diego City Hall for decades. Last week, you received the Sun Sunshine Award for pushing for more government transparency. What drives you? Well, the only way I could explain it is to say it's a calling. I mean, it, it reminds me of what Sarah Palin says, that what, why is she doing her, her, her political career? Well, I have the same calling myself, and, and this is what I chose. What are you most proud of in your civic work? Well, basically, the way to accomplish anything in, uh, in politics it doesn't seem to be through the city council or, or a newspaper. The way to accomplish anything is through the courts. And I have accomplished, I say, the, the ones I'm most proud of are the two published appeals I have where I won a lawsuit, two lawsuits, against 
the city for violating the Brown Act, that is the Open Meetings Act. Uh, one was uh, against the city and one was against Center City Development for discussing matters in closed session that they had no right to discuss in closed session. Uh, I, I uh, consider them the most outstanding uh, pieces that I've, that I've done because future uh, lawsuits and f future activists can refer to these lawsuits as precedent. That's why. How many times have you sued? Oh, at least 12. At least 12. And I, I only remember losing uh, one. It's easy, it's easy to beat the city on, 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 uh, on Public Records Act because they're so secretive. Now, Ian, you went from a prestigious job at the Salk Institute. You ran a research lab. lab. How do you make the transition from, from that kind of job, the job of a scientist, to that of being a civic watchdog? The two aren't that different. They use different tools. But basically, I'm fact-oriented, so I always get documentation of anything we're doing. And then you get scraps of information, and your job is to make a coherent story out of them. So they're not that different. They're both intellectually very satisfying. What are some of the most memorable cases that you've worked on? Uh, two. One is to essentially kill Doug Manchester's development on the Broadway uh, Navy complex. That is dead. That will never be built. And so the Navy eventually is going to have to decide whether it's going to keep the best land in San Diego uh, that's still available or whether they're going to be a good neighbor and come to some sort of agreement. The second case was when the white elephant of the Broadway Pier cruise ship terminal happened. We lost a park at the bottom of Broadway. With the help of the hotel union, Unite Here, and the cooperation and eventually friendship of uh, the developer, Lanefield developers, and eventually the port, uh, we've created at least partial mitigation for that by the Lanefield Park, which is about to probably break ground in about a year's time. Mel, earlier in the show, we ranked uh, the state governments in the country on government transparency. How would you rank the city of San Diego when it comes to transparency? Oh, well, my, my lawsuit right now says they're pretty bad, on, uh, specifically on what's called the hotline. It's a city auditor hotline. I mean, there, there just isn't any transparency. 90% of the complaints called into the hotline are covered up. Gentlemen, we're going to have to wrap it there. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you. Last year, we told you about Archie's Acres, uh, San Diego program training veterans in sustainable agriculture and business skills. It's designed to help them transition into civilian life. Tonight, KPBS reporter Allison St. John introduces us to a combat vet who's launching his own business based on his survival training. There are a lot of hot sauces on the shelves here at Whole Foods. There's a story behind this hot sauce, Forager Mike's Dan Hot Sauce. It's the story of Marine combat veteran Mike Haynes. Uh, you can camouflage yourself with natural camo and you can stalk up and touch a deer. Haynes has a passion for the outdoors and for wild edible foods. I think it really started for me in Sear School actually. And um, Sear School is a school that uh, all recon Marines have to go through because it's a prisoner of war training school. So the, it stands for, Sear is S-E-R-E, -E. it stands for Survive, Evade, Resist, Escape. So they teach you a little bit about survival, you know, and how to, uh, how to survive if you're captured, pretty much. 
So I started learning about wild edible plants during that time. This is the paddle Haynes was given when he left the Marine Corps in 2004. It has his insignia, his award ribbons, and phrases he was known for. There's natural foods all around us. Let's go pick a salad. <laughs> I would say that one quite a bit. Haynes is always on the lookout for wild edibles. These are really good. I've ever tried these. Little mustard flower tops there. This is a picture of my uh, team, Recon. But I'm in your uh, far right there. That's you here? Yes. That's a tough group right there. <laughs> When Haynes got back from Iraq in 2004, he did not have an easy time. The combat experience is, is a, a totally different scenario. And coming back and, and kind of letting that go is very difficult at times. You just don't come back and it's all gone. Because turning that, uh, you know, the on switch that's been triggered when you're in combat is, is uh, you know, it, it's turned on, but turning it off is, is a very difficult process at times. And it takes time, you know. Upon getting out, I just had some tremendous uh, trust issues and uh, uh, some very serious anger issues as well. Haynes tried to hold down a job, but it didn't last long. He went back to school, and for two years he was homeless, living in canyons near Balboa Park downtown. So I'd go to school, do my uh, homework at the computer room. When they closed, that's when I would go out and find a place like this. So I'd crash out there at night. This is where the Marine Reconnaissance Training came in handy. I'd probably turn around and go back. The reason being is because this looks like a well-worn trail. We would patrol all night long, and then during the day to hide from the enemy, we, we would harbor up under a bush. And that's what we were training for all this time. So we'd be under a thick brush all day long. I was safe in nature. You know, that was my kind of my comfort zone. And it still is at times, you know. What turned Haynes' life around was a six-week course, the Veterans Sustainable Agriculture Training Course, or VSAT, at Archie's Acres in North San Diego. This is what wild lettuce looks like. It turned out that wild edible foods became Haynes' ticket to survival in a whole new way. During the course, he learned how to develop and present a business plan, and he chose to pitch something he had made for years, a hot sauce with all organic raw ingredients. What you're looking at here, this is, uh, this is my dang business plan presentation. And the reason why it's called that is because, in fact, that is the name of the hot sauce. It's called Dang. So uh, there, there's some samples going on out there. I hope to hear some uh, crunching as I'm giving this uh, presentation. Haynes was introduced to an investor to back his new business. He found a small production company in Vista that specializes in making raw organic products to mix, bottle, and package his hot sauce. The hot sauce is a, uh, it has three superfoods in there, and it has maca, spirulina, and mesquite. In order to make this raw in the highest integrity, I used apple cider vinegar, raw apple cider vinegar. He was also introduced to a purchaser at Whole Foods, Dwight Detter, who immediately saw the potential of Dang Hot Sauce as a hot seller. I met Mike. We spent a couple hours together reviewing his product, reviewing his labeling, his packaging, everything about it, where he was having it manufactured, and said, OK, let's, uh, let's work on this. Detter served in the military in the 1970s. He made a connection with Haynes, remembering how hard it was to transition out of the military. It's an interesting hot sauce. A lot of hot sauces are there just to, to, to burn your mouth and create a lot of heat. What was fun with it is that it was organic and it had these uh, three superfoods that none of the other hot sauces had. So you have a unique flavor, you have some unique ingredients in it, and along with Mike's story, makes, uh, makes for a, a triply fun hot sauce to put on the shelves. Haynes never thought his love of natural foods would help him survive in business. He's thinking beyond his own survival now. The environment is what sustains our lives, you know, and we have to respect that. So, and we have to understand our connection to that if we are going to create a sustainable future for our future generations. And being that I have a daughter, that's very uh, foremost on my mind. That story from KPBS reporter Allison St. John. Dang Hot Sauce is currently being sold at 10 Whole Foods markets in San Diego County. This is KPBS Evening Edition. I'm Jeffrey Brown. On the next news hour, a preview of the Illinois primary, plus a new group pushing for a bipartisan presidential ticket. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. 
What are things made of? So all life, us, Justin Bieber, everything made of carbon chains. It all comes down to elements. And this must be hydrogen. Oh, oh. What are they? Why do they behave the way they do? It tastes like salt. New York Times tech guru David Poe gives an off-the-charts tour of the periodic table. My globes are on fire. I'm seeing atoms. Hunting the elements on Nova. April 4th at 9 on KPBS. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. State lawmakers are contemplating a feast of new food laws this year. One of the proposed bills making its way through the California legislative process would require that seafood eaters at restaurants be told where their fish is coming from. Another would allow people to sell food products they make in their homes. This could apply to baked goods, jams, and mixed nuts. And a third resolution is calling for tighter rules on labeling food items like gluten-free breads. Where do you stand in all this food talk? Are you concerned that fish you're being served might be contaminated? Do you have a savory sauce you secretly wish to sell? Tell us your thoughts on Twitter. You can like us on Facebook. And, of course, you can email us at kpbs.org. And now Dwayne has a recap of tonight's top stories. San Diego's independent budget analyst says pension reform will save money, but not through reforming pensions. The IBA says the savings from Proposition B will come from salary freezes with a net savings of $950 million over 30 years. And California gets a B- in a national report card on corruption in government. Only five states got a B, and no state got an A. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, KPBS dot org slash evening edition well the last winter storm of the season has moved on but spring is getting off to a chilly start we leave you with a look at the forecast have a great night